joining us today at the Deleuze and Guattari Quarantine Collective's ongoing reading of Anti-Oedipus. We're heading into Chapter 3.3, .3, The Problem of Oedipus, and from here, uh, I fully expect these chapters to start taking longer for there to be more questions, more discussion. This is where the material so far has started to come together and starting to be applied, and it's, uh, it's going to start getting really fun. As always, uh, if you are interested in our project, you can find us on Twitter at uh, D and GQC. Uh, you can join us on Discord if you just search us anywhere. And if you like what we're doing, please jump over to Patreon. Uh, every dollar counts to keeping us uh, floating and to keeping uh, things online here. Uh, and uh, it's DGQC on Patreon. Uh, as we dive into uh, the problem of Oedipus, which is section 3.3, .3, do we have any questions leading up to this or anything people want to start with before I dive into the first bit of the reading? All right, I'm going to take that as a uh, wonderfully excited, absolutely. Um, I'll begin to uh, read then. The full body of the earth is not without distinguishing characteristics. Suffering and dangerous, unique, universal, it falls back on production, on the agents and connections of production. But on it, too, everything is attached and inscribed. Everything is attracted, miraculated. It is the basis of the disjunctive synthesis and its reproduction, a pure force of filiation or genealogy, Newman. The full body is the unengendered, but filiation is the first character of inscription marked on this body. And we know the nature of this intensive filiation, this inclusive disjunction, where everything divides, but into itself, and where the same being is everywhere, on every side at every level, differing only in intensity. The same included being traverses indivisible distances on the full body, and passes through all the singularities, all the intensities of a synthesis that shifts and reproduces itself. It serves no purpose to recall that genealogical filiation is social rather than biological, for it is necessarily biosocial inasmuch as it is inscribed on the cosmic egg of the full body of the earth. It has a mythical origin that is the one, or rather the primitive one too, should one say the twins, or the twin, which divides and unites into itself the nomo, or the nomos. The disjunctive synthesis distributes the primordial ancestors, but each member of the primitive community is himself a complete full body, male and female, binding to itself all the partial objects, with variations that are solely intensive, and that correspond to the internal zigzag of the Dogon egg. Each one intensively repeats the entire genealogy for himself, and everywhere it is the same, at both ends of the indivisible distance, and on every side, a litany of twins, an intense filiation. At the beginning of La Renaud, Paul, Re Michael, I'm going to ask you to pronounce that. Also, this name, because I don't want to ruin it. Um, Le Renard Pal. And it's by Marcel Grell. Oh, those are difficult to pronounce too. Um, Marcel Griol and Germaine Dieterlen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, those two sketch out a splendid theory of the sign, the signs of filiation, guide signs, and master signs, signs of desire, intensive at first, which fall in a spiral and traverse a series of explosions before extending into images, figures, and drawings. The last section dealt with the idea of this primitive territorial machine and the, 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 the earth, the, the way that territory was perceived. Uh, the idea of history being read as this universal, universalized history. Moving into this section, it opens very quickly with the idea of the full body of the earth, the full body being uh, all of its parts, all of its things, all of its intentions, even uh, the images, figures, and drawings, the full body. Uh, uh, is, it itself is not without distinguishing characteristics, talking about the different ranges, the areas of the territory as they exist, the, the way that things are differentiated that we have this eternal one that all comes sort of from, uh, to put it, uh, that all things are sort of within. Uh, but the separation out, the, the, the birthing of a thing, the, the filiation, the having a child, being born, all of that, what we come out of and how we are born is inscribed on this uh, as the first thing. 
It's a really poetic uh, deep passage. I'm very open if anyone has a opinion or thought on this section, uh, on this on this passage. There's a lot said here. Uh, yes, I suppose it's not birth per se, right? It's the things that basically construct what a birth is and how it takes place socially, right? Yeah. So, no, no, I think and I, I probably shouldn't have used the term birth because uh, I meant it more poetically than uh, like human being pushed out of a birth canal kind of birth. Uh, the, the creation, the, the act of Genesis, I guess. Well, no, that, that is part of it, though. They're talking about um, part of the, the distribution of energy here is how birthing can be constructed socially, right? Because what we're, we're seeing is how the distribution, how male, female, how that is itself caught up in the distribution of Newman, right? So the part of the recording process, part of the genealogical aspect of the affiliation and the alliance is, um, it takes place here, right? So this, this part about differing only in intensity is really interesting. Um, and uh, so this is, I mean, the problem of Oedipus, right? So Oedipus um, is sort of like this mechanistic causal, or, or or Freudian psychoanalysis is like this mechanistic causal reductive thing, where it reduces everything to base elements and it sees all these preceding causes. Um, but here it looks like we're getting we're sort of getting rid of this linear A to C. A to B to C sort of thing with this differing only in its intensities. So in this way, it, well, well, let me, let me take a second and pull up a quote and tell, and maybe you can tell me if it sounds like what D and G are doing. One second, if you don't mind. I, I generally don't uh, mind. I think Brooks, we instituted a new rule, right? All moments of silence will be filled in with uh, excerpts from Finnegan's Way, chosen at random. Oh, Jesus Christ. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, uh, where, do we, where do we start uh, with something else while we're waiting for that? Because there's so much said inside of this. Uh, the question in there, why are they talking about twins? In what way do they mean that? Uh, I, I think they go into this a little bit more, but they're drawing on, and I don't know Marcel Grau's work, but they're drawing on a, a particular a particular myth from the Dogen to demonstrate what they're talking about. So in the previous section, like Brooks was saying, they talked about how associus functions, what it's going to do, right, in terms of codification, in terms of characterization. Um, and even if you're just saying about birth, right, that's part of, what we're seeing here is the affiliative generation, but the socius also, especially the earth, also adds to fashion a memory, which is part of your alliance, kind of your ethsatsis, if you will. And so the Dogen A here, this is part of the fashion of memory that the socius does. So this myth, um, the story, the creation story, however you want to call it, is part of the distribution of uh, uh, Newman, through the second synthesis, and it's acting through a creation story. Well, and, and the creation story they're utilizing here, and they talk through it, they will use the term Dogon egg, not just here, but elsewhere, and they use the term Nomo or Numo. Uh, the, the Dogon religion uh, is, the, the idea is that the first thing that happened is the sky goddess uh, created Nomo, and the Nomo is this uh, little thing, this, this thing, uh, a creature, uh, human-ish, I don't want to say it's not male or female that like it just was and it kind of was a whole bunch of different stuff but the first thing that it did is it it basically multiplied itself into a whole bunch of different twins and the twins had infighting amongst themselves and uh because of this uh one of them was sacrificed uh there's a whole like crazy there's an amazing like mythology around it but the, a lot of the religion sort of is talking about sort of the uh bisection of man, bisection of people, the placement of people into twins that were opposing, but also on the same side. Like Nomos is, is a group of beings and it was a splitting and a multiplying. Uh, it was a, it's a fascinating sort of creation myth, but there's one of the reasons he's using that is to kind of run with it. Yeah, uh, Boskard posts uh, the Wikipedia article, it's spot on. 
that's what it is. And uh, uh, Griel and, and uh, I'm never going to say their names right. Uh, they're specifically the experts on the Dogon, uh, and they're sort of everything. Um, so that's why they're referenced here. Uh, the Nomo divided his body among men to feed them. That's why it's also said the universe had drunk of his body. The Nomo also made men drink, gave all his life principles to human being. The, the, the self-sacrifice, it's, it's, it's a pretty beautiful story, but it, the, it opens with them being twins and, and having that split. My, that's my assumption of why they sort of drive that home on the, the twins, the, the two voices, the, the uh, bi-univocalization. One is you're either one of the, or the other. Like they're really pushing towards that as a way to understand mankind for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got it. It's division and union, right? So whether we're taking them as twins or the twin, right? They're they're subdividing into each other, right? So you, yeah, I think you're right about that as it being an inclusive disjunction because you can see it doesn't have to be the one anymore. It has to be the two, right? But um, I think, Ken, you found your... Um, as always, you've got lengthy and copious highlights for us. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he says that it it can, you know, it can be totally arbitrary, the sequence of events A, B, C, D, uh, insofar as the intensities can be the same or or different or something. Um, and then there's this one part. Um, uh, yeah, right here. Uh, the final energetic view, on the other hand, sees the sequence thus. A, B, C are means towards the transformation of energy, which flows causalessly from A, the improbable state, entropically to B, C, and so to the probable state here, uh, probable state D. Here, a causal effect is totally disregarded, since only intensities of effect are taken into account. So, I mean, does that does that resonate with what's being said here? Uh, I'm uncertain here, uh, specifically. Um, it, the the way I as I'm looking at this that he's talking about and being very particular is the sort of nature of instant understanding affiliation, a pure force affiliation or genealogy. Newman is kind of this natural. Thing. The full body is unengendered, but filiation is the first character of inscription marked on the body. The first thing we know is filiation, the, our lineage, our own genealogy. We know the nature of this intense affiliation, this inclusive disjunction where everything divides, but into itself, where the same being is everywhere, at every side, at every level, differing only in intensity. The, the way for us to be looking at uh, who we are, how we are, how a creature understands its place, how we understand our place, on the full body of the earth is, uh, to me, he's talking here about not necessarily reversing the causal nature of energy, which I think is something we could definitely sort of debate about, but more about the, the birth or creation of uh, what we might call agents or subjects in this space and how uh, they, the, the whole reality of our creation is not just biological. I don't have my mother or father just because of you know the general genet, uh, the general genetics, and that that's passed on. It's the the whole thing is also social. It is together that these things happen. It is all of these things are not being privileged. There is all of this constantly happening, and it's a matter of intensities is how we define them and separate them out. That's how I'm reading this section, this uh, paragraph specifically. Yeah, that was that was great and very clear. Um. So, so intensities are are what moments of affect. Uh, affect would not be a terrible way to put it. Yeah. Okay. I think affect is actually a, a really specifically good way of putting it. Um. Yeah, but they're I would saying say affect. That, that, but they're saying that intensities, like in these different registers, so like filial, filial, that, um. That that they have a specific quality in the different uh, territories they are, or whatever. Hmm. Like like, do the filial intensities have the quality of being f 
filial intensities? Or is it just like they're affects that have no real preformed quality and it's just that you're within the frame of some sort of filial alliance that they that they're seen that way? Do you see what I'm trying to ask? Yeah, they're they're pro- so it, it's all production here, right? So that um, it's not even just that they're seen that way, right? We're talking about how memory is fashioned and actually distributed uh, during the second synthesis. And as you start getting into intensity, you're passing into voluptus, right? So you're getting into consumption and consummation. But um, yeah, I, I I think what I would say to that is. With the filial, right, you have the alliance because they coordinate together, right? They're part of the same distribution, or rather they're distributed with each other. I think is probably the easier way to say that. I'm actually going to um, step in because I'm, I, 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 I see where you're going, Jeff. I'm going to say I'm, I'm going to take another angle because what they're being very particular here to talk about is we have to talk about it in the context of where it is in the text. We're talking about around the nature of territorial inscription where the socius is the full body of the earth and savagery as they call it. Uh, specifically in the case of that, we're talking about the filiative and in that socius, unlike ours, and this is why it's probably difficult for us to understand. Uh, I have, my family is my parents and my filiative line is Dexter, my son, Maybe I have cousins. That's like all of us. That's the way uh, sort of under capital, the nuclear family or arranges socially and biologically our affiliative alliance, our affiliative world. In the, in, the, in the primitive socius, in the savage, the way that they lived and the way that they are, that's not how affiliative works. Affiliative is an incredibly complex set of lines that they understand back, not only back generations, but also how they're, uh, sort of connections interweave them across almost horizontally uh, across almost the alliance as well. Like we're talking about intensities of the overall way that you connect with people in the affiliative line being deep and, and expressive and a hyper networked pattern, which is the case during the, the full body of the earth, this, the socius, the original socius, the first socius that they're describing. And that's, I think their point here is that, uh, genealogical affiliation is social rather than biological. It is biological as it's inscribed in the egg, the beginning of time. We have that tied back, but it's mythical as well because we're born into it and we understand who we're connected to, the twin, who we are, who we will be, what different choices we're making. We're still connected to all of that in relation to the entire affiliative alliance that we're part of. That's my, that's to be very specific. That's what I think they're trying to get at here. And that's, I, I'm, I may be skipping ahead because I know it's, I, I know it's coming in the next one, but like they're ending and then they move in. I'm going to, I'm going to read the next, like, cause it's like a half a paragraph. It's just a few lines. Uh, if the full body falls back on the productive connections and inscribes them in a network of intensive and inclusive disjunctions, it still has to find again and reanimate lateral connections in the network itself. And it must attribute them to itself as though it were the cause. These are the two aspects of the full body, an enchanted surface of inscription, the fantastic law, or the apparent objective movement, but also a magical agent or fetish, the quasi-cause. It is not content to inscribe all things. It must act as if it produced them. It is necessary that the connections appear in a form compatible with the inscribed disjunctions, even if they react in term on the form of these disjunctions. Specifically here, we're talking about the literal inscriptions on the full body of the earth. And... Uh, how immediately everything is assumed to be part of that. And that includes my filiative line. I, I don't come from my parents like I do, but that's not really how they think about it. Their, their world is about this hyper-connected, ridiculous lineage that they can trace back to the earth itself or to a god creature or to an origin story like the Dogon egg, which is the Dogon's sort of beginning of the, everything for them. And that's why they use that uh, setup. It's about the, the earth saying, you're the, I'm the reason you're here, is how it feels to be within the socius that is the earth. The, sorry, I, I keep rambling. I'll, I'll stop. I thought that was great. Um, I mean, what I'm hearing is, uh, what I keep hearing is personally the, the implicit critique of, 
uh, you know, Freud's totem and taboo, um, uh, that, you know, any sort of favoring of, uh, exogamy over endogamy, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to reduce it to some sort of, um, uh, you know, nuclear family relationship that like, you know, you're, you're competing with either your father or your mother for one of the other, the other's love or recognition or something like that. And that um, makes the incest prohibition not make sense. Yeah. I mean, I, and Cersei, I, Cersei, I think Cersei, let me know if I'm saying more. Uh, can we relate this to the genealogy of societies as perceived through a mythological lens? I think their argument here is the mythology is something that we utilize, as they say, uh, at the very end of the first paragraph. Uh, they utilize the two authors who really broke down and understood how the Dogen myth and story happens. And specifically what they did is, quote, sketch out a splendid theory of the sign. First, the signs of filiation, guide signs, master signs, signs of desire, intensive at first. Uh, which fall in a spiral and traverse a series of explosions before extending into images, figures, and drawings. The, the poetry here is about the mythology coming from still this demand that it come, that everything is fall back on. It has been fallen back on by the full body. That's an awkward way of saying it. The full body has fallen back on all of this, on the productive connection, and has inscribed them into the network of intensive and inclusive disjunctions. How this is done through mythology is by starting with the signs, making their way through, the explosions happen, and then it extends into the actual images, figures, and drawings that we have still to this day, kind of thing. The, the, the elements that people can look at and end up representing these kinds of setups, if that makes sense. I might be saying it funny. I think I'm understanding your question. Uh, Boastgird asks, why do they keep coming back to the Dogon religion? Uh, my guess is because the book uh, that was written by the people Michael named, I would feel, I feel terrible whenever I anglicize someone's name like that, uh, Griol and uh, Dieterlin, um, is, is exceptional and, and breaks down from an ethnological standpoint the why of that they believe in this, not just that they believe in it and how it works and how it operates. It's much more of a almost a assemblage style looking at the way that the mythology and the creation myth works in the Dogen people. All right, good. And foreign, I just always fuck up foreign people's names anyway, Michael. So thanks for saying this for me. Uh, we Americans have a problem. Uh, I'm going to read the next paragraph, though. Uh, Such is alliance, the second characteristic of inscription. Alliance imposes on the productive connections the extensive form of a pairing of persons, compatible with the disjunctions of inscription, but inversely reacts on inscription by determining an exclusive and restrictive use of the same disjunction. It is therefore inevitable that alliance be mythically represented as supervening at a certain moment in the filiative lines, although in another sense, it is already there from time immemorial. Marcel Guerrero describes how, among the Dogans, something is produced at a certain moment at the level and on the side of the eighth ancestor, a derailment of the disjunctions, which cease to be inclusive and become exclusive. Once this occurs, there is a dismembering of the full body, a canceling of twinness, a separation of the sexes marked by circumcision, but also a recomposition of the body according to a new model of connection or conjugation, an articulation of bodies for and between themselves, a lateral inscription with articulatory stones of alliance. In short, a whole arc of alliance. Alliances never derive from filiations, nor can they be reduced from them. But this principle once established, we must distinguish between two points of view, the economic and political, where alliance is there from time immemorial, combining and declining itself with the extended filiative lineages that do not exist prior to alliances, in a system assumed to be given in extended form. The other mythical, which shows how the extension of a system takes form and delimits itself, proceeding from intense and primordial filiative lineages that necessarily lose their inclusive or non-restricted use. From this viewpoint, the extended system is like a memory of alliance and of words, implying an active repression of the intense memory of filiation, or if genealogy and filiations are the object of an ever-vigilant memory, 
It is to the degree they are already apprehended in an extensive sense that they certainly did not possess before the determinations of alliances conferred it on them. On the contrary, as intensive filiations, they become the op object of a separate memory, nocturnal and biocosmic, the memory that indeed must suffer repression in order for the new extended memory to be established. And this starts to get at what I was saying earlier, where to understand filiation alliance, you've got, you at least got to understand them in relationship to each other, right? So I, I look at it as like a why and that's good, but there are other ways to approach it. But what they're building out here is how the the uh, disjunctions, right, the use of Newman during the second synthesis, the relationships between the alliant and the affiliated, right? And here they, they bring in the, the two sides of it, uh, and the, the talks about how alliances, they, they don't derive from filiations. Again, they say the same thing, that you can't deduce alliances from filiation. But the... Uh, the way that they work, one is economic and political, uh, where alliances from time immemorial, blah, 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 blah. Um, uh, the other is like the way to sort of have that lens and be able to look at it, I find, I think is kind of the point of this. Um, the Dogons again being invoked because once you have the twinness, which at the time, uh, the twins don't really have drastically different, like when they start, it's not like they, you know, it spits out four sets of twins and each one is wildly different. They're twins. They're intended to be like copies. It's intended to talk about the, the duality of man. It's intended to have that kind of feeling. But at some point, uh, after the divisions and after the fights and the one troublemaker, which is kind of the idea of the Nomo, um, they split off and they become separated. They become man, woman, uh, they become uh, father, child, they become leader. And like it, it grows and it becomes, uh, how does he phrase it in here? Um, the derailment of disjunctions, which cease to be inclusive, but become exclusive. Once this occurs, there's a dismembering of the full body, uh, a canceling of twinness, a separation of sexes, uh, but also recomposition of the body according to a new model of connection. The, what they were before that, the not sexless, they were both sexes, which isn't the same thing as being sexless. Uh, they also weren't like hermaphroditic. They were both in a, that odd sort of way that only a myth really can be really fascinating. Uh, but they were also uh, having twinness canceled, which I think is a fascinating way to talk about the, the inclusive disjunction where everything is kind of part of that. All of us have something in common with the Nomo when it was first born, as it divided and as it separated out. As they did this, suddenly I actually... I look at myself, I go, oh, I, I have a penis, I'm a man, I am like that nomo, is what he's talking about here. And it's a really interesting idea to say that that's the dismembering of the full body. That is the moment when we've separated ourselves out, that's when we've removed uh, the body from the organs, so, so to speak. I like it. I'm, I'm always fascinated by their language around this because it's the idea of myth. Uh, the memories of genealogy and filiation are already apprehended in the extensive sis sense that they did not possess before the determinations of alliances conferred it on them. That they all come together. Uh, Deleuze uh, says in Logic of Sense and, and a few others that uh, the moment you are part of language, language comes as a whole. Uh, you can't sort of be part of the world of language. I think Lacan said the same thing. Like once you're in it, you're in it. <laughs> and that's it. And this is kind of that once you're in alliances and once you've, you know, apprehended that and made it part of you with that memory, it all comes together, it comes at once, if that makes sense. Yeah, before you go on, we should spend a minute on what's going on here in terms of, so we've got uh, inclusive disjunctions right now, all of a sudden we're exclusive disjunctions, yeah. And that... Uh, might be worth digging into a little bit more. Oh, sure. Uh, so, such as alliance, the second characteristic inscription. Alliance imposes on the productive connections, the extensive form of a pairing of persons compatible with the disjunctions of inscription, but inversely reacts on inscription by determining exclusive and restrictive use of the same disjunctions. It is therefore inevitable that alliance be mythically represented as supervening at a, super, a certain moment in affiliative lines, 
although in another sense it is already there from time immemorial. So right, you're seeing kind of um you're seeing how alliance here actually affects the disjunctive uses, right? So the alliant um the alliant use of Newman actually works back on itself in a sense, right? So you actually get uh, an exclusion in the memory. So for the for to kind of contextualize it, right? When something happens, I, I usually use business as an example because I think it's easier. But when something happens in an organization, right, it's not necessarily predicated on the roles, right? It's not the boss and the, or rather it's not the manager and the managed, right? But the memory includes that, right? And it can even seem to be that. In that sense, you're seeing part of the exclusive disjunction uh, cutting off the, providing the kind of either or with the roles, but also having been part of um, the same process in a different capacity altogether, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, the, the inclusive and exclusive disjunction, like as a concept and that switch, I know we've gone over it uh, already at this point a few times, but it's going to come up a lot. And the idea of the exclusive disjunction is essentially saying that the in Lacanian terms, the symbolic and the imaginary are uh, are very separate things. Uh, and there's a line between them, and this is that, and this is that, and that's the way it goes. Whereas an inclusive disjunction, while still having, because it's a disjunction, there's still disconnection. Uh, by being inclusive, it allows those, uh, so they're not so different. Actually, we can continue to relate them, and we can have them together inside of the same property or the same thing, or they can be part of the same setup. And it's a, it's a big shift uh, to sort of uh, be thinking about that instead, instead of this constant separating out disjunction. Yeah, it's sort of like what we saw in 1.2 where we talked about how during the second synthesis, the paranoiac and schizophrenic uh, work through and with each other, right? So you're seeing how the alignment and the affiliative or the inclusive and exclusive disjunctions actually are part of the coordination, right? Uh, Remke also asks, um, I guess I understand. She was curious about the role of repression here, citing, from this viewpoint, the extended system is like a memory of alliance and of words, implying an act of repression of the intense memory affiliation. How does it imply a repression of the memory affiliation? So this is kind of interesting because they do this elsewhere. In fact, where I always reference the, the diagrams, they, they do the same kind of, um, uh, I guess I would call it a rhetorical move. So if you notice they're saying from this viewpoint, they're going to go on, right, and then say, on the contrary, as intense affiliations, they become an object of a separate memory, nocturnal and biocosmic, the memory that indeed must suffer repression in order for the new extended memory to be uh, established. So there's a little bit more going on here. Yeah, and, and it's going to actually, Rimka, that is going to get teased out a lot more in the next few paragraphs. Uh, Ojat says, so inclusive disjunction synth synthesis is like the gelling of otherwise different terms, like an emotion. It's, yeah, it, it sort of. Um, the idea that there's no such thing as a man or a woman. I am, uh, Brooks, me, myself, I am neither gay nor straight nor bisexual nor anything. I am not a thing, the thing, a thing. I'm kind of all of those depending on a whole shitload of factors. And it's not that I'm, you know, it uh, doesn't mean I'm out. Oh, it means I can have sex with anyone or I am having sex with everyone. It's like, no, no, these, these things, these representations, these, these symbols, this imaginary thing is, is not exclusive. It's not that I am this thing or I am that thing or this or that. I am mommy or daddy, which is the oedipalization and the bi-univocalization. Instead of saying like, look, you can sort of be mommy and daddy. Also, you can sort of be grandma and grandpa. Also, you can sort of be daddy, grandma, depending on like these things aren't exclusive. They, they go together and it's more about understanding the process of becoming and the way that the language is utilized and understanding what it implies for us and how it instantly represses within what we're doing, if that makes sense. Uh, hope that answered. Um, I'll continue to the next paragraph, though, because I do want to keep heading through this. Um, 
We can better understand why the problem does not in the least consist of going from filiations to alliances, or of deducing the latter from the former. The problem is one of passing from an intensive energetic order to an extensive system which comprises both qualitative alliances and extended filiations. Nothing is changed by the fact that the primary energy of the intensive order, the Newman, is the energy of filiation, for this intense filiation is not yet extended and does not yet comprise any distinction of persons, nor even a distinction of sexes, but only pre-personal variations in intensity, taking on the same twinness or bisexuality in different differing degrees. The signs belonging to this order are therefore fundamentally neuter or ambiguous, according to an expression employed by Leibniz to designate a sign that can be positive as well as negative. It is a question of knowing how, starting from this primary intensity, it will be possible to pass to a system in extension where the filiations will be filiations extended in the form of lineages comprising distinctions of persons of per parental appellations, or the alliances will be at the same time qualitative relations, which the affiliations presuppose, as much as vice versa. In short, the ambiguous intense signs will cease to be ambiguous and will become positive or negative. A uh, little bit more explained out uh, what I was just saying about how we aren't really anything. Um, the idea of twinness, again, going back to the, uh, the Dogon and their, uh, the first god, uh, the way that they sort of behaved. We are sort of both, but at some point uh, through this, we do separate ourselves out. Like, what, what is that? How does that work? Uh, because it's where we came from, where we're going, our literal genealogy, and then our alliances, which are the rest of the sort of larger social network and how they interact. It's a great paragraph. Um, I'm actually wanting to jump to the next one, unless anyone has a comment, because the next one is more, this may be seen clearly again, which I kind of like diving straight to. All right. This may be seen clearly in a passage from Levi Strauss, explaining for the simple forms of marriage, the prohibition of parallel cousins and the approbation of cross cousins. Each marriage between two lines, A and B, bears a positive or negative sign according to whether this couple results from a woman being lost to or acquired by line A or B. Now, when he says line here, he means like lineage, familial lineage. In this regard, it is not important whether the regime of filiation is patrilineal or matrilineal. In a patrilineal or patrilocal regime, for example, quote, related women are women lost, women brought in by marriage are women gained. Each family descended from these marriages thus bears a sign which is determined for the initial group by whether the children's mother is a daughter or a daughter-in-law. The sign changes in passing from the brother to the sister since the brother gains a wife while the sister is lost to her own family." End quote. But as Levi Strauss remarks, one also changes signs in passing from one generation to the next. It depends upon whether, as a quote, sorry, quote, it depends upon whether, from the initial group's point of view, the father has received a wife, or the mother has been transferred outside, whether the sons have the right to a woman or owe a sister. Certainly, in real life, this difference does not mean that half the male cousins are destined to remain bachelors. However, at all events, it does express the law that a man cannot receive a wife except from the group from which a woman can be claimed because in the previous generation a sister or a daughter was lost, while a brother owes a sister or a father a daughter, to the outside world if a woman was gained in the previous generation. The pivot couple formed by an A man bearing a B woman obviously has two signs, according to whether it is envisaged from the viewpoint of A or that of B. And the same is true for children. It is now only necessary to look at the cousin's generation to establish that all those in the relationship positive, positive, or negative, negative, are parallel to one another, while all those in the relationship, positive, negative, or negative, positive, are cross, end quote. It seems like a fairly straightforward, more mathematical take on how we find debt between families, uh, how people are passed, how the lineage and alliances, uh, again, come into being, how the understanding of my sister being owed or me gaining a wife uh, is a mentality that is existent and very much based on uh, you know, one person marrying in or outside of their familial group 
which side is losing what and which side is gaining as a mentality. Um, perhaps there's a, there's a, um, obviously there's like this, this level on the, on the socius, but maybe there's also a underlying point about intensive processes here. Um, in, in that the way in which, you know, uh, a, a set of intensive processes might be seen to like inherit or, or have uh, relations in that way. Yeah, I think that's right. So even when we're seeing cousins or, or right children or, or these different ways in which children are produced simultaneously, right? Your point is to extend that further and say this also affects how, I don't know, um, milk is being made in that, yeah? No, I, I, I would say more so that sometimes it it seems like a a notion like or an intensive process right like this very fundamental thing you know it has like these complex like alliances and was born from like another intensive process and that these are all like complex relationships that exist even on the body with their organs the uh you mean the the full body of the earth in this case or do you mean the body without organs? Well, I mean, he's talking about the full body of the earth. What I'm saying is that it's applicable on both sides, right? Oh, that's true. That's fair. That's fair. Or maybe that's a worthwhile thing to think about at the very least. No, I think I think it's spot on because it's it's about the recording. We're talking about recording. Like that's the big thing for these last few paragraphs is uh, when I come into being and subjectivity, how do I relate to the people around me, the things I'm supposed to do, my obligations, my actions, all of that. Like, why, why do I do what I do? Recording's a major part of that. And the way that the full body falls back on the production of these relationships, and it does so in this process by uh, having these sort of massively complex alliance and familial lines that, again, I enter into sort of just by being born into them and the web is there waiting for me for this massive, you know, uh, complexity that I can be if it turns out I'm the daughter and the family only has daughters. Well, that sucks for the dad. <laughs> like there's a whole bunch of different rules that come with it and debts and how I could lose a sister but gain a wife or I gain a sister. If I'm a, if I'm a woman, but I also lose myself to another family and why and how the Again, the, the way I find this and how I pass into this is, in their minds, not a uh, series of exclusive disjunctions, but instead inclusive series of intensities that I'm passing into this and that I'm becoming part of with this whole thing. With That's why they keep going back to the positive or negative um, as a thing. It's like this overall who owes what when, and if I were to mathematically break it down like uh, Levi Strauss does here, I could map out topologically this large scale, oh, well, this family is down 12 points, this one's up three points, this one's down six, and slowly figure out the alliance. It's a lot more complex than that, but that's kind of, I think, what they're getting at here, that like, you have this sort of, uh, again, I'm jumping ahead to the next paragraph, I should stop that. Um, I think that's what they're pointing out, that Levi Strauss has, had, has this sort of natural mathematical uh, uh, set up for the entire thing. Yeah, I would go so far as to say it's a type of accounting, right? It's mm -hmm. not the accounting we're used to because usually accounting is somewhat retrospective, usually, sort of. But what we're seeing here is, and this is their point with the, the myth at the end of that paragraph where they write about the different signs in that. Um, here we go. So, guide signs, master signs, signs of desire, intensive at first, which fall into spiral, and traverse a series of explosions before it's staying to images, figures, and drawings. So this is like accounting that is productive, right? So uh, the distribution is happening upon the connections and the intensities that are going to be consumed, right? And it's happening in terms of this codification, which is one of the things the Socius does. Um, so distribution, marriage, and all of that, they're constructed uh, and, and, and 
as well as the norms that uh, attend them are constructed through this um, this kind of accounting system. But what makes it particularly unique is it's still got flows. So these um, these pluses and these negatives, this comes with blockages, this comes with um, uh, it's sort of like a relay system, right? It comes with openings and closings. It comes with pushes and pulls. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, been, I'm now thinking about web comparison. I think I would probably say the way that the body without organs operates uh, here inside of this specific socius, I'm uncertain even the term body without organs, like, like what we talk about when we mean that, I think you and I both, like we have the same uh, general definition of like what that is. Um, I'm uncertain that that exists in the same way in this space because the, like the, the whole reality is that the socius sets that up. Like the body without organs is telling me who I am and what my relations are between things and what relations are between stuff. I'd be hesitant to say that the socius doesn't do that for people under both uh, the savage, so the earth socius and the despot, that that's sort of determinate by your social layout uh, rather than by any sort of BWO. Like the socius is the one that tells you how things relate rather than you having your own body without organs as a unique subject. I don't think it exists in the same way. I'd, it's worth debating, but that's just some quick thoughts. I, I think we have to be really careful because I would have said that they were both pre codeterminate, right? Because obviously, um, whatever your own subject subjectification is, is going to affect the way that you see the socius and whatever the socius is, is going to affect your subjectification. Yeah, yeah. As I've been thinking about this more. That's what Guattari says about it, at least with, when it comes to the four types of unconscious, which I don't want to go too into here, but. Quattery Friday is 5 p.m. PDT, but yeah, yeah. as I've been, <laughs> got a plug. Um, but I've, as I've been thinking about it more, I think the big thing is how the relationships get constructed, right? So how the socius is going to produce the subject. Like you're saying, you're absolutely right. The viewpoints, the viewpoint of the subject is going to be conditioned on those through syntheses, yeah? But I think the major thing is going to be, and, and this is what they're doing, right, with the system of flows and blockages, connections and disconnections through this, uh, what I'm calling an accounting system, but it's, it's just Leibniz, right? So it probably is more mathematical than it is financial. Um, but it serves that purpose. And so with that, and to your point about the way that processes produce other processes, right, it fits into this um, this construction of relationships and key in some sense, construction of conditions, too. This will be a worthwhile discussion for us to have at some point. I like this. It's a thing I'm completely not certain of. Certain of. I, I think I agree with you, though, overall, uh, webcam. I do. I'm just trying to think about how to specifically voice that when we talk about, um, you know, the determinate nature of the socius and how it, it operates. Because I think they've said things like uh, that the socius inside of the... Uh, inside of this first, the, the socius inside of the first, the first socius overdetermines uh, uh, desire and is, as such almost overwrites the body without organs. I think they even said something like the body without organs can only exist in capitalism. I, I'm going to have to find these quotes. I will find stuff like that. So it is a good discussion. Um, I'm going to put a note down for that. It's time to get into high digger territory here. I know, I know, I know. Be, being in the world of the body without organs in the socius. It's a, it's a we do we have a high digger reading group for a reason. It didn't happen out of nowhere. <laughs> I mean, it sort of did at first, and then it's like, oh shit, this is actually not bad. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Yeah, all right, we'll we'll get through that. But that's, uh, I still think overall, I, I think it's a fair thing to say that right here he's talking about sort of this very. Uh, this very specific way Levi Strauss puts the issue of uh, lineage and filiation and alliances and how it becomes a positive negative and assigning values very quick as, you know, leaving or going. Uh, so I'm going to read the next uh, paragraph because that continues that and critiques it. But once the problem is put in this way, it is less a question of applying a logical combinative apparatus governing an interplay of exchanges, as Levi Strauss would have it, than one of establishing a physical system that will express itself naturally in terms of debts. 
It seems to us very significant that Levi Strauss himself invokes the coordinates of a physical system, although he sees this as nothing more than a metaphor. In the physical system, in extension, something passes through, that is, of the nature of an energy flow, negative or positive, positive, negative, or something does not pass or remains blocked, positive, positive, negative, negative. And something blocks or, on the contrary, causes passage, something or someone. In this system, in extension, there is no primary affiliation, nor is there a first generation or an initial exchange, but there are always and already alliances, at the same time as the filiations are extended, expressing both what must remain blocked in the filiation and what must pass through in the alliance. I don't necessarily have a ton. I think it's a fairly crisp thing. Uh, I'll try it. Uh, we try to analyze every paragraph. Uh, uh, to him, the positive, positive, negative, negative is not a metaphor. The, what Deleuze and Guattari are doing here is they're saying, no, it's, it's, there's more than that. That there is this energy, this, this exchange that's happening, and that it's always happening. That there was no first, which I really like. There, nor is there, in the system of extension, there is no primary affiliation. There is no, hey, you know, the first thing that you're part of. It's like, no, and this is not the first deal that anyone's done. You enter into the system, there are already alliances, there's already flows, there's already positive, negative, negative, positive, 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 negative, negative, et cetera, all of that. Um, uh, as the filiations are extended, expressing both what must remain blocked in the filiation and what must pass through in the alliance. It's already decided by the time sort of you come into it. I really like that. It's a really crisp uh, critique and really simple and I think, again, makes their point that they're trying to get at here about... Uh, the socius and how it organizes the production and how uh, it claims it for itself rather than uh, these people being part of it uh, as a setup. Uh, yeah, born into debt very much. Is that far off generally? Yeah. Uh, maybe Ken, I don't, I'm not sure when, when the paragraph will give you, when the section will give you the opportune moment as our friend Jack Sparrow wants to say. But I think this does get into what you were saying about the critique of taboo and totem. So at some point, maybe it would be a good opportunity to expand on that. But one of the big things here, right, is to your point about endogamy and autogamy, right? Like, well, what makes all of that possible, right? And, you know, why would there be a norm for it to be good or bad, right? How does an ethics um, get constructed through this? Or rather, in attendance with it, right? Because it's a simultaneity in my perspective. And that's kind of what you're seeing here, right? This, that's why I say it's like an accounting system where he's Deleuze and Guadri say it's not a metaphor, right? It's, it's a physical system. It's doing stuff, right? It's, it's making all of this possible through the um, direction and restriction of flows or coordinations or connections, right? It's producing the intensities that are going to be consumed and consummate the assemblage. So we're seeing how this is not like... Um, this isn't just like a, um, a far off uh, chart of accounts, right? This is all uh, taking place right there in the creation of memory and also the, uh, the actual production in the society, or rather the production of that society. Uh, I will continue to the next paragraph as we move a little bit further. Uh, but again, more Dogon, so be ready for more Dogon. The essential is not that the signs change according to the sexes and the generations, but that one passes from in the intensive to the extensive, that is to say, from an order of ambiguous signs to an order of signs that are changing but determined. It is here that resorting to myth is indispensable, not because the myth would be a transposed or an inverse representation of real relations and extension, but because only the myth can determine the intensive conditions of the system system of production included, in conformity with indigenous thought and practice. That is why a text of Marcel Grill's, which looks to myth for a principle that would explain the avunculate, uh, seems decisive to us and seems to avoid the reproach of idealism that usually greets this kind of attempt. We have a similar view of the recent article in which Adler and Cartre return to the question, these authors are right in remarking that Levi Strauss's kinship atom, with its four relationships, brother-sister, husband-wife, father-son, maternal-uncle-sister's son, 
represent, presents itself as a ready-made whole from which the monster as such is strangely excluded. Although, depending on the circumstances, she can be more or less a kinswoman. I said monster, didn't I? Why did I say monster? Jesus. So, boy, Seems I mean, like it might be something edible. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a Freudian little thing there. Um, all right, I'll say it again. Uh, presents itself as a ready-made whole from which the mother, as such, is strangely excluded. Although, depending on the circumstances, she can be more or less a kinswoman or more or less an affine in relation to her children. Now, this is indeed where the myth takes root. Myth that does not express, but conditions. As Rial relates it, the Urogo, breaking into the piece of placenta he has stolen, is like the brother of his mother, with whom he is united by this fact. Quote, this individual went away into the distance, carrying with him a part of the nourishing placenta, which is to say a part of his own mother. He saw this organ as his own and as forming a part of his own person in such a way that he identified himself with the one who gave birth to him. She was the matrix of the world, and he considered himself to be placed on the same plane as she from the viewpoint of the generations. He senses unconsciously his symbolic membership in his mother's generation and his detachment from the real generation of which he is a member, being, according to him, of the same substance and generation as his mother, he likens himself to a male twin of his genetrix, and the mythical rule of the union of two paired members proposes him as the ideal husband. Hence, in his capacity as pseudo-brother to his genetrix, he should be in the position of his maternal uncle, the designated husband of this woman. And yeah, my slip was both Oedipal and mythological, so throw it in there. Um. I think, I mean, one, one point about the slip, you don't. So I, I've been getting tinges of like, um, always already there symbolic order through re reading this. I know that's terrible and I'm, I'm, uh, a heretic for doing that but like so the 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 socius is always is already over determined before you come to be in it right so so what you're seen as and your your position or whatever is already sort of talked about and and planned on before you even are born or whatever and so in that way you get over determined um but yeah, so there's there's all this stuff that's already there and moving and flowing and whatnot, and um, so it doesn't it doesn't matter if you have had a specific kind of father or mother to um, then not see the general category of, of father or mother or or brother or whatever um, as a certain way, in so far as uh, uh, in your socius it's put a certain way. And um, in this way, things get overcoded, right? Um, so this this last part, um, the the generate generatrix, um, uh, the designated husband of this woman uh, as the the son. Um, there doesn't need to be anything like genital sexual about this but insofar as we have uh the mythology of freud floating around that pops in there just because that's already determined and floating around and so the the problem with the way freud explicates things in totem and taboo i guess is that things are given some sort of transcendental status instead of this status as as determining but changing um, like somehow we all feel guilty because we killed the, um, the, uh, the, the all father or something like that. That's a, the, the interesting thing. So just to mention, because I'd love if anyone has a real good grasp on what the thing they're trying to say here with the allegory they're using from the, you know, about, uh, from the Dogon. Uh, but just to mention, so, uh, the, the Nomo, the little, uh, uh, sort of twins that keep popping out. Um, one of those is named uh, Yurgo, and uh, his entire thing uh, is, and it's a male, 
uh, is to pursue his twin, his twin sister, his twin sister, his female twin. It's like his thing is that he wants that. And the process of this is, is complex. And there's like a million stories with him in it. Um, uh, sort of with the entire setup, but I thought, uh, we're worth mentioning. I don't really understand the full ending here and how it plays back. Uh, if anyone wants to take a crack, it's open. I think I can help uh, open this up, right? So one of the major things here is we're not dealing with an accounting system and metaphor any more than we're dealing uh, with myth metaphor here. Right? This is this is stuff that's happening, right? This is the collective memory that's fashioned and actually acting um, as part of the socius, right? This is part of how the socius distributes, falls back on production and produces, uh, and ultimately consummates and allows for consumption, right? Can I get to introduce it? So what we're seeing here with this myth and what they're doing with Marcel Grial is they're looking to explain this a little bit further. So they're showing us more about this system of plus and minuses and how it actually um, is engaged in production. And they're expanding a little bit more on this critique of levy strauss right? So they've gone through why it's not simply uh, affiliative determinism anymore than it would be a line, right? The point is they coordinate together and they do different things with each other. So you don't have to give primacy to one over the other. You can understand their relationships. So one of the points they, they want to criticize about Levi Strauss, right? And they're basically just using Marcel Grau to, to make this point, uh, this case in point, is the role of the mother, right? Which Levi Strauss doesn't seem to um, develop sufficiently, right? So the, the quote, the authors are right in remarking that Levi Strauss's kinship atom with its four relationships, brother, sister, husband, wife, father, son, maternal uncle, sister, son, presents itself as a ready-made whole from which the mother as such is strangely excluded. Although depending on circumstances, she can be more or less a so-called kinswoman or more or less a, a so-called affine in relation to her children. So this is part of where like the determinism and the change is coming from, right? The the Levi Strauss thing gives, shows us uh, one way of taking it is to take it as like the universal deduction, but more so it shows us different possible coordinations, but it also shows us that the mother as such is part of what makes these possible but also has to be allowed to circulate in certain ways to make certain coordinations possible, right? So the mother could go, uh, what happens as mother, that distribution can move a certain way with the flow to allow something like the father, or excuse me, the husband, wife, but the mother could flow differently, right? Or it could be blocked as part of the uh, maternal uncle, sister, son. So you're seeing how the mother even though there is this form of determinism in terms of coding, right, in terms of what these functionalities uh, do, we're also seeing how there is um, there is this sort of plus minus aspect of it, right, where the mother can be part of the blockage of the flow or part of the uh, promulgation of the flow. I think that makes me want to move right into the next paragraph because it, I think you're making some of the points that they're starting into, so I'm going to do that. Um, Doubtless, all the dramatis personae will be found to come into play from this point on. Mother, father, son, mother's brother, son, sister. But it is evident and striking that these are not persons. Their names do not designate persons, but rather the intensive variations of a vibratory spiraling movement. Inclusive disjunctions, necessarily twin states through which the subject passes on the cosmic egg. Everything must be interpreted in intensity. The egg and the placenta itself, swept by an unconscious life energy, susceptible to augmentation and diminution. Diminution. The father is in no way absent, but Amma, the father and genitor, is himself a high intensive part, imminent to the placenta, inseparable from the twinness, which relates him to his feminine part. And if the Yurugu son carries away a part of the placenta in his turn, it is in an intensive relationship with another part that contains his own sister, or twin sister. But aiming too high, the part he carries away makes him the sister of his mother, who eminently replaces the sister and to whom he becomes united by replacing Amma. 
In short, a whole world of ambiguous signs included divisions and bisexual states. I am the son, and also my mother's brother, and my sister's husband, and my own father. Everything rests on the placenta, which has become the earth, the unengendered, the full body of anti-production, where the organ's partial objects of a sacrifice nomo are attached. It is because the placenta, as a substance common to the mother and the child, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> a common part of their bodies, makes it such that these bodies are not like cause and effect, but are both products derived from this same substance, in relation to which the son is his mother's twin. Such is, indeed, the axis of the Dogon myth related by Griol. Yes, I have been my mother, and I have been my son. It is rare that one sees myth and science saying the same thing from such a great distance. The Dogon narrative develops a mythical wise monism, where the germinative plasma forms an immortal and continuous lineage that does not depend on bodies. On the contrary, the bodies of the parents, as well as the children, depend on it. Whence the distinction between two lines, the one continuous and germinal, but the other discontinuous and somatic, it alone being subjected to a succession of generations. T.D. Lysenko employed a naturally Dogen tone, turning it back against Wiseman to reproach him for making the son the genetic or germinal brother of the mother. The Morganist medallions, following Weissman, start from the idea of the parents and are not genetically the parents of their children. If we believe their doctrine, parents and children are brothers and sisters. Is there a paragraph break in anyone's text, or am I going to read this entire page? I have a paragraph text, and I don't think it would be wise to continue because the following paragraph is also a page long in mine. So. Good, good God. All right, fair. I'll stop there. So to, to get it started, right? When they, when they, so the last point they made in the preceding paragraph was getting into the role of the Matrix, right? So they're all good Baudrillardians. They went out and saw Neo's movie. And no, of course they didn't do that. Uh, more so, it's the Matrix in terms of the system of possibilities, but also how they actualize, right? So. And this is one of my favorite points they made, right? It's not so much about somebody being their father, right? This is an ontological point. It's about the father as an intensity and its distribution and subjectivity, right? We're talking about how the bodies are, rely on these uh, disjunctions, right? Rely on the libidinal energy, right? So the, the three syntheses more precisely uh, for what they're going to do, but also for their, right? That functionality, their subjectivity. Uh, and the connections and relationships, right, and the disconnections for that matter. So we're seeing here how the possibilities, but also how they actualize into all bound up in codification, um, have this kind of matrix function, right? Particularly um, expanding on the way the mother fits into that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, a, a large part of this is, again, them diving deep into this idea. Uh, Levi Strauss. Uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I'm not super read in Levi Strauss. Uh, his, they, and they mentioned it earlier, his uh, sort of four quadrants of uh, people that matter, the kinship atom, uh, the brother, sister, husband, wife, father, son, maternal uncle, sister, son, the four relationships. He considered those to be uh, determinate, that they are the same everywhere, that there is a sort of way that society works. And this is the base level of all of it. And that's, this was his idea of, and their argument is strongly against this concept that uh, it is not the same everywhere, that um, we have you know, a generalized way that things work, but it isn't that the bodies or the names are identical uh, and how they operate is not identical, uh, that it's more, significantly more contingent than that, I think. Well, look at how the memory functions here, right? So we're seeing how the Dogen myth mates father and mother as these intensities right as what they do makes that possible right and that's i think really critical because this is helping to show us how the socius functions in this um construction right in this assemblage yeah i think so and this this last paragraph is just about you know, sort of going further down into that and the idea that um yes we have the the mother what it was one of his uh uh, we have the brother, sister, husband, wife, father, son, uh, uncle, 
nephew, like me and my cousin, basically, I guess. Um, but instead, he's saying here, like in the Dogen setup, it's my mother's brother and my sister's husband, but my own father. Everything comes back now to the placenta because the, the myth is ultimately what creates those relations and creates those intensities and, and places them within us, uh, as I understand their conversation here. That's the final line that I, it was in, I think it was a footnote actually that got expanded out. But if we are to believe their doctrine, parents and children are brothers and sisters. Uh, the idea of how relations work is very different from place to place. Uh, and, and very poignantly, how one functions as a father is not simply, um, it's not just something that you're always doing, right? So it's not a question of it being an essence of your being one switches between father and brother, right? And it, this is part of the distribution. There's, um, and then there's also relationships that make that possible, right? Like it, the way it fits together is part of this distribution and this networking, um, at least this, this disjunctive networking. But the son is not somatically his brother's mother and twin. That is why he cannot marry her, bearing in mind what we said earlier to be the meaning of that is why. The one who should have married the mother was therefore the maternal uncle. The first consequence of this is that incest with the sister is not a substitute for incest with the mother, but on the contrary, the intensive model of incest as a manifestation of the germinal lineage. Then again, Hamlet is not an extension of Oedipus, an Oedipus to the second degree. On the contrary, a negative or inverse Hamlet is primary in relation to Oedipus. This Sub, the subject does not reproach the uncle for having done what he himself wanted to do. He reproaches him for not having done what he, the son, could not do. And why didn't the uncle marry the mother, his somatic sister? Because he must not, except in the name of his, this germinal filiation, marked by ambiguous signs of twinness and bisexuality, according to which the son could have done it as well, and could have been himself this uncle in an intense relationship with the mother twin. The vicious circle of this germinal lineage closes, the primitive double bind. Neither can the uncle marry his sister, the mother, nor from that moment can the son marry his own sister. The Yurigu female twin will be delivered over to the Nomos as a potential affine. The somatic order causes the whole intensive scale to collapse again. Actually, if the son cannot marry his mother, it is not because he is somatically different. Uh, he's somatically from a different generation. Arguing against Melanowski, Levi Strauss has demonstrated convincingly that the mixing of generations was not in the least feared as such, and that the incest prohibition could not be explained in this manner. This is because the mixing of generations in the son-mother case has the same effect as their correspondence in the case of the uncle-sister, that is, it testifies to one and the same intensive germinal filiation that must be repressed in both cases. In short, a somatic system in extension can constitute itself only insofar as the filiations become extended, correlatively to lateral alliances that become established. It is through the prohibition of incest with the sister that the lateral alliance is sealed. It is through the prohibition of incest with the mother that the filiation becomes extended. There we find no repression of the father, no foreclosure of the name of the father. The respective position of the mother, our father, as kin or affine, the patrilineal or matrilineal character of the filiation, and the patrilineal or matrilineal character of the marriage are active elements of the repression and not objects at which the repression is directed. It is not even the memory of filiation general that is repressed by a memory of alliance. It is the great nocturnal memory of the intensive germinal filiation that is repressed for the stake of an extensive somatic memory, created from filiations that have become extended, patrilineal or matrilineal, and from the alliances they imply. The entire Dogon mythology is a patrilineal version of the opposition between the two genealogies and the two filiations, in intensity, and an extension, the intense germinal order and the extensive regime of somatic generations. All right. Well, go, go. okay. Yeah. We we should just we should move on. We should move. On. All right. Um, okay. 
I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack. Um, the, the intensities, uh, uh, Tiernan nails it uh, here, I think. Tiernan, why, do you, why are you server muted? It's wild. Um, I fixed that. Um, uh, so, so Levi Strauss sits there and he goes, hey, here's how, here's how society works. It's these four relationships. This is all of them. And they're like, ah, oh, wait a second. There's a lot more relationships than that. And, and those things are kind of, you know, not really determinant. That's not, you know, the thing. Instead, it's the nature of the socius, the organization of desires and production that is laying this out. And the reason it lays it out with the incest prohibition is not that, uh, oh, uh, I want to, uh, we, we can't have you fuck your mom, so you can't do that. We tell people that. It's like, no, it's the, the way production is organized here is actually what lays out all of this. And the prohibition with the sister allows the lateral alliance. Uh, if, I, if I fucked my sister, I, I can't marry her off. Um, and it's not that I think that or I go, boy, if only I could just bang my sister or my mom. Uh, like, that's not how it works. Instead, it's the production, the nature of production um, kind of moves through things and and organizes when it falls back on them. And so on the one side, the prohibition of incest with the sister is because we need the alliances. We need to have the extension, the, the growth of the group, the La, the affiliation is with my mother. I'm not going to, I don't fuck her. It's, there's no repression of the father, no foreclosure in the name of the father, which they should on very quickly. We can come back to that. Kent. The whole entire reality is that um, to them, as they talk about it, is uh, they are active elements of the repression. They are part of the machine that is doing the repression, but not objects at which repression is directed. That is a very particular note that they're wanting to hit that it's not that they're directing repression at the mother or father or my desire to fuck with them or any of that stuff it's that the mother or father my relationships with them in the larger social sphere and the way the socialist is operating and my production of desire as we've talked about from the beginning production of desire is production so the desire is being produced desires created through that nature the repression and all of that the machine the social machine the socius organizes this and as such the nature of not fucking my sister and not fucking my mother is built into the way production operates under this socius because without one i can't have alliances without the other filiation goes to shit and the production itself uh is necessary here that's uh my version thank you for that that makes a lot of sense um and it's you know it's largely the thing that I guess Freud sort of miss in some ways, some ways it doesn't, but that, um, that your parents aren't just your parents, right? You're, they're also representatives of this larger machine. Um, but the, I mean, the, the name of the father thing and how that works, is just a totally different level of what would you call it? Analysis or something. Um, because in some ways you can say like that the name of the father is like um like like the inscription of patriarchy or something like that patriarchy being written onto you or like the status quo being written onto you in well, some ways um, oh no that's a, i think that's exactly it and i think their point here is yeah. not that there is no foreclosure of the name of the father ever but i think they're saying here we don't find it because the nature of this socius is not patrilineal or ma like patrilineal and matrilineal is beside the point. There is no father directing laws in the way that this complex network is set up in this socius. Ours, different beast, whole different fucking thing. But this socius specifically, this is how it's making. It's a different, as Jack said, it's a different double bind. It's a different everything. This is the nature of production of desire here. And so when they say, like, there, there we find no repression of the father, no foreclosure in the name of the father. They're not saying there in the human psyche. They're saying in this socius. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I can see a way in which the way that apparatus is supposed to work could still be relevant insofar as um, something happens, uh, some sort of 
traumatic event happens to where you just can't even fathom how you are situated within this um, uh, within the socius. Um, whether that's like, uh, you know, you become an outcast or something for some arbitrary reason or something like this um, can sort of dissolve the way that you thought things were guaranteed to work. Yeah. And I think um, uh, Cersei says it's not that Levi Strauss was wrong all the time, just that he wasn't right all the time. He did not uncover the symbolic superstructure of human society. I think, I, and as Jack says, they actually agree with him in this paragraph. I think their their critique is not uh, that he's completely wrong in every way. It's that there is no superstructure in that sense, but instead we need to be looking at the production of desire and how the production is organized uh, rather than these hard, fast rules of, well, it's everyone has a mommy, everyone has a daddy, and it's, no, no, talk about how production moves, how things are incentivized and structured that way, because that's what produces us, produces desire, produces, you know, production effectively. Yeah, for sure. And in that way, you know, mommy and daddy can be completely different things at these different levels. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's that's their point. Different. Yes, yeah. that's that's yeah. their entire point about the twinness or bisexuality that the the way that daddy is daddy is not my father the name of the father would therefore be a thing actually if if father was a thing and that's i think their argument against levi strauss it's not it's not daddy it's not mommy it's these coextensive filial fam familial and alliance relations that you know basically have their incentivization structures that the socius falls back on tells us how production is made and we fall in line and our repression does as well not aimed at a person, not aimed at daddy, not aimed at mommy, not aimed at me as a son, but as part and intrinsic to our interconnected relations. Because I think they're about to get into that exclusive disjunction, so I'll dive in. Uh, the system in extension is born of the intensive conditions that make it possible, but it reacts on them, cancels them, represses them, and allows them no more than a mythical expression. The signs cease to be ambiguous at the same time as they are determined in relation to the extended filiation and the lateral alliances. The disjunctions become exclusive, restrictive. The either-or-else replaces the intensive either-or-or-or-or-or. The names, the appellations, no longer designate intensive states, but discernible persons. Discernibility settles on the sister and the mother as prohibited spouses. The reason is that persons, with the names now designated to them, do not exist prior to the prohibitions that constitute them as such. Mother and sister do not exist prior to their prohibition as spouses. Robert Jarlin says it well, quote, The mythical discourse has as its theme the passage from indifference to incest to its prohibition. Implicit or explicit, this theme underlies all the myths. It is therefore a formal property of this language, end quote. We must conclude that, strictly speaking, incest does not and cannot exist. We are always on this side of incest in a series of intensities that is ignorant of discernible persons, or else beyond incest, in an extension that recognizes them, that constitutes them, but that does not constitute them without rendering them impossible as sexual partners. One can commit incest only after a series of substitutions that always moves us away from it, that is to say, with a person who is equivalent to the mother or the sister only by virtue of not being either, she who is discernible as a possible spouse. Such is the meaning of preferential marriage, the first incest that is permitted. But it is not by chance that this kind of marriage rarely occurs, as though it were still too close to the non-existent possible. For example, the preferential Dogon marriage with the uncle's daughter, she being equivalent to the aunt, who is herself equivalent to the mother. If we just have a bunch of people, and we don't talk about how they're related socially, and we don't care, there's no such thing as a sister or mother. That's the thing we create. We create this, and we label people, and we call things that, as we create the prohibitions as well. There's no need to call anyone mother or sister if we don't have alliances that we need to marry, or we don't have filiations that we need to care for. The, the names are things that are added 
implicitly with the restriction being being created. Prior to that restriction, incest is not possible because mothers and sisters don't exist. Uh, we call them that by naming them. We've almost created the taboo in and of the same act. That's my interpretation. It has been for the last two times we've read through this, the last time we read through this for sure. It's a big shift. And again, understanding how representation plays a, a role in repression. I cut this out of the final podcast. So like, as far as people at home, they have no idea that I'm being awkward here. Uh, except our poor YouTube audience, all, all two of them. Yeah, but we know, Brooks. <laughs> oh no, you guys are very aware I'm an awkward person. But I actually have a Twitter page called uh, DGQC Awkward Pauses. I post all these. <laughs> <laughs> if only it would be too long. Um, this uh, this thing here, the system in extension, is born of the the. Uh, Intensive conditions that make it possible is like somewhat related to what I was talking about earlier, right? Yes. Um, yes. What with like the the molecular and the molar being interrelated. Uh, otherwise, I'm not really sure what to say about it. Yeah, I don't know if there's much more to say. I mean, I mean, you were clear earlier. It's it's a good thing to do a callback because it it really was a good point, and it's. I mean, the, the running theme is their core critique of this idea of determinant reality of what we are and how representation sort of plays within the repression at the social level and the personal level, I think. They're using a lot of, like, I mean, obviously, like, the Jungian influence is obvious, right? But I also wonder how much influence um, Roland Barthes is having here with references to, like, mythologies and, 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 and also... I mean, the socius seems kind of similar to a lot of the systems he would have described as well. Remka has a question. Uh, would anyone like to expand on this line? The disjunctions become exclusive, restrictive. The either or replaces the intensive, intense either or, 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 or. Uh, an inclusive disjunction uh, is, uh, you have two things. Like there is, a, there's two things, but... Uh, it's two things that aren't necessarily uh, exclusively separated. Um, a per, I am, we'll go with a very simple one that's kind of modern. Uh, I am either gay or straight. I am man or woman. Uh, I am either or else. Uh, there's no option. There's no third option. Uh, this is not me saying that. Don't take this shit out of context. I'm just saying that's the exclusive disjunction. Um, the inclusive would be like, well, I'm either man or woman or not or another thing or other stuff or this thing or that thing or kind of sort of a little bit more masculine or maybe more feminine today um sierra crimin wrote an amazing book uh where she uh went to class one day uh and would cross-dressed uh before she transitioned um I, one of the more complicated sort of sexuality stories sierra crimin's amazing uh and it's a worthwhile book to read sort of on the entire thing about man becoming woman and what that intentionality is this is that it's the either or 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 rather than the either or else um the that's the the, the difference and so when we're talking about the exclusive disjunction being applied as a prohibitive thing naturally by introducing the idea of sister mother as a thing uh, i look at everyone and i go oh i either you or you or you or you or you I can have as my sexual partners. I can get married. This like the that's the inclusive disjunction. The exclusive would be like, oh yeah, uh, it's I either I'm going to do this or that, and there's not all these options. It's a it's built into the way that the representation works, and the connections are allowed, which simply aren't allowed to connect that way. And Risha, yes, everyone edits out pauses. That's how these that's how podcasts work, because <laughs> there's so many, especially with deep shit like this. We had a pause in Logic Ascents two weeks ago that was like six straight minutes and no one talked because everyone was reading. Um, and no one will ever know that happened except for this recording. But I'm going to edit this out so this is a passing moment. Uh, any comments or notes? Uh, and I'll move on to the next large paragraph. Uh, uh, Griel's article is without doubt the text most profoundly inspired by psychoanalysis in the whole of anthropology. 
Yet it leads to conclusions that cause the whole of Oedipus to shatter, because it is not content to pose the problem in extension, thereby assuming its solution. These are the conclusions drawn by Adler and Cartry. Quote, it is customary to consider incestuous relations in myth either as the expression of the desire or the nostalgia for a world where relations would be possible or would meet with indifference, or as the expression of a structural function of the inversion of the social role, a function destined to found the prohibition and its transgression. In both instances, one takes as something already constituted what is in fact the emergence of an order that the myth narrates and explains. In other words, one reasons as if the myth placed on the stage persons defined as father, mother, brother, and sister, whereas these roles belong to the order constituted by the prohibition. Incest does not exist. End quote. Incest is a pure limit, provided that two false beliefs concerning the limit are avoided. One that makes the limit a matrix or an origin, as though the prohibition proved that the thing was of first desired as such. Another that makes the limit a structural function, as though the supposedly fundamental relationship between desire and law were manifested in transgression. It is necessary to recall once more that the law proves nothing about an original reality of desire because it essentially disfigures the desire, and that the transgression proves nothing about a functional reality of the law because, far from being a mockery of the law, it is itself derisory in relation to what the law prohibits in reality, the reason why revolutions have nothing to do with transgressions. In short, the limit is neither a this side of nor a beyond. It is the boundary line between the two. Incest, that slandered shallow stream, always crossed already and not yet crossed. For incest is this is like this motion. It is impossible. And it is not impossible in the same sense that the real would be impossible, but quite the contrary, in the sense that the symbolic is. That last bit, uh, we'll have to dig into a little bit there, quite a bit. But um, the line here again, uh, incest doesn't exist prior to the creation of itself. Um, the idea behind the Oedipal complex, as they've talked about through this and as Freud wrote, is the idea that um, I want to fuck my mom because I'm not allowed to, that it's forbidden. The, the forbidden part of it is what makes it so sexy to me. Um, and the, that isn't really the, the drive between it, the, as it works. It's not that that's the thing. They're also saying uh, that it's not a first desire, that primordially I want to fuck my mom and that's my most important thing to me. Instead, their argument, as I said in the last one, the one before, and this, they're through this entire section, is that in a place where we do not have mother-daughter as a thing, there's no reason to have an incest prohibition. People don't have a desire naturally. They might fuck their moms, like in that whole thing, but it's not like, oh, I want to do it. Oh, I'm not allowed to. Now I really want to. Instead, it's uh, the, the social relations and the production just outlines that you're not doing that thing. The example they used earlier, and I think they use again, is the idea of a hunter that uh, eats its own kill. Uh, in in primitive societies, that was that's seen as a significant faux pas. Also, not a thing that really happened. Like, it's just not. Uh, it's something that happens now, but back it just wasn't. And they they cite some things. There's some interesting books on it. Hunters would go out. They'd get their kill. They wouldn't just immediately sit, start a fire, and eat everything and take the leftovers back to the group. They just didn't do that. It's not that because they were forbidden or it's this is the way production flows. The same way that people today seem perfectly fine with going to work for the work that they're doing. People are getting more angry, but the way production is organized does this. And that's, I think, their underlying argument here, I think. The production organizes all of this. Well, I'll read the next bit about uh, how it might be possible to fuck moms and daughters and sisters. Because why not? What does it mean to say that incest is impossible? Isn't it possible to go to bed with one sister or mother? How do we dispense with the old argument? It must be possible, since it is prohibited. The problem lies elsewhere. The possibility of incest would require both persons and names. Son, sister, mother, brother, father. Now, in the incestuous act, we can have persons at our disposal, but 
They lose their names in as much as these names are inseparable from the prohibition that proscribes them as partners, or else the names subsist and designate nothing more than a pre-personal intensive state that could just as well extend to other persons. As when one calls his legitimate wife mama or one's sister his wife. It is in this sense that we said we are always on the side of it or beyond. Our mothers and our sisters melt in our arms. Their names slide on their persons like a stamp that is too wet. This is because one can never enjoy the person and the name at the same time. Yet, this would be the condition for incest. Granted, incest is a lure. It is impossible, but the problem is always deferred. Is, not that, is, the, is that not the nature of desire, the one, that one desires the impossible? At least, in this instance, the platitude is not even true. We are reminded how illegitimate it is to conclude from the prohibition anything regarding the nature of what is prohibited. For the prohibition proceeds by dishonoring the guilty, that is to say by inducing a disfigured or displaced image of the thing that is really prohibited or desired. Indeed, this is how social repression prolongs itself by means of a psychic repression without which <clears throat> it would have no grip on desire. What is desired is the intense germinal or germinative flow where one would look in vain for persons or even functions discernible as father, mother, son, sister, etc., since these names only designate intensive variations on the full body of the earth determined as the German. Now, how is, is this? Is this an entire fucking page paragraph for everyone? Because this PDF has been pissing me off lately. Yeah, it ends up, but why is this? All right. It is always possible to use the term incest as well as indifference to incest for this regime composed of one and at and the same time being or flow varying in intensity according to inclusive disjunctions. But that is precisely the problem. One cannot confound incest as it would be in this intensive non-personal regime that would constitute it with incest as represented in extension in the state that prohibits it and that defines it as a transgression against persons. Jesus Christ, that sentence. Jung is therefore entirely correct in saying that the Oedipus complex signifies something altogether different from itself, and that in the Oedipal relation, the mother is also the earth, and incest is an infinite renaissance. He is wrong only in thinking that he has thus transcended sexuality. The somatic complex refers to a germinal implex. Incest refers to a this side of that cannot be represented as such in the complex, since the complex is an element derived from this, this side of. Incest as it is prohibited, the form of discernible persons, is employed to repress incest as it is desired, the substance of the intense earth. The intensive germinal flow is the representative of desire. It is against this flow that the repression is directed. The extensive Oedipal figure is its displaced represented, the lure or fake image born of repression that comes to conceal desire. It matters little that this image is impossible. It does its work from the moment that desire lets itself be caught through, by, though by the impossible itself. You see, that is what you wanted. However, it is this conclusion going directly from the repression to the repressed and from the prohibition to the prohibited that already implies the whole paralogism of social repression. I'm going to let someone else talk for a second because that hurt me. Oh, I may uh, push to the next uh, paragraph or two. We'll probably go a little bit beyond two o'clock so we can actually finish this rather than have next week be like a paragraph. But why is the germinal implex or influx repressed, since it is nevertheless the territorial representative of desire? Because the thing it refers to, in its capacity as representative, is a flow that would not be codable, that would not let itself be coded. And extra, can you leave the door closed? <laughs> Isn't it in a door opening and closing phase? It's a whole thing. I never left that phase, but... Uh, so I'll continue. Serious... Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, he's 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 done. No chain can be detached. Nothing could be selected. Uh, it'll be a second. Give me two seconds. I was gonna say. Um, so we got some serious paragraphage going on here. 
and we are at the two hour mark. Do you want to maybe cut it early and then, I don't know, do an extended session later or just do like a short session next week? And then go over that last paragraph you read because that there's a lot happening there. It, it may be worth us. Actually, I think you're right. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do a poll. Um, uh, continue next week is the poll. Uh, and uh, continuing next week uh, will be simple. It will be us finishing the chapter. And then we'll actually go back through and any questions you have or notes you have, I think we have a larger discussion. I think this is actually worth us doing a full conversation around. So uh, the polls continue next week. If you think so, uh, if you want us to plow through, now would be the time. Uh, hit thumbs up or thumbs down in the uh, chat. That's not going to be even a close one, is it? Yeah, okay. Uh, While that uh, poll is going on, just one brief announcement. Uh, you got one thumbs down. Uh, the lit group is considering changing their time. I'm going to post a poll after this session. And I'm announcing this now because I don't want anybody. I know people are going to leave as soon as the session's over. So just look for that poll if you want to be part of that and that conversation toward considering a time change, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I'll be op that'll be op open shortly. Excellent. Uh, so watch for that poll. Uh, I am going to close this out. We will next week continue directly from where we just left off. I'll probably start the paragraph over actually. Uh, I'll see if Dexter wants to join us and, and read along, which might work out. Uh, but it's volume 162. Uh, and then uh, if you have any questions, period, uh, please bring them, ask away, uh, note them out. Uh, we will have larger discussions. I think it's worth it. This is a really important concept to nail because we're talking about how repression works and they're using Oedipus as the tool to do that. Um, yeah, um, we can hang out here for a minute, seriously, if you want. But I'm going to go ahead and close out the stream. Thank all of you for joining us. Uh, feel free to join us on Discord, Twitter, and uh, thank all of you for everything.